All right, we'll let the kids be dismissed to their class. This morning we're going to be in Mark chapter 5, continuing through the book of Mark. I've uh, given the message this morning a title of Two Daughters Saved. However, we're only going to see one daughter saved this week, and we'll see another daughter saved next week. So this is a part one of Two Daughters Saved. I figured I could have given the same title two weeks in a row, A Daughter Saved, but I didn't want to do that. (laughs) So we have Two Daughters Saved, part one. Mark chapter 5 is where we begin this morning in verse 21. Remember, um, Jesus has been displaying his authority over creation. He has been, he's displayed his authority over demonic forces. And today we see that he has the authority to rescue sinners. If I had a key proposition this morning, it would be that Jesus has the power to heal the physical problems and the spiritual ones. And he is available to heal. So this morning we begin in verse 21, and uh, you're going to see that we're kind of, uh, there's kind of like two stories that get pushed together. And so um, verse 21 through 24 is kind of more about um, Jairus and his daughter. And uh, so Uh, Next week, if there's questions about Jairus and and what happens with his daughter, we're going to get to that, Um, just so that you're aware, if we don't cover everything about about him this morning. So verse 21, we'll begin reading. We'll read through our text, and then we'll pray together. It says, When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. A woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of the many physicians and had spent all that she had was and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garment, I will get well. Immediately the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, He turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And the disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. That's our text for this morning. We're thankful for it. Let's pray together. God, we are thankful for this text, for these, uh, the truths that are before us. God, I pray that you would give us wisdom as we seek to make the best possible application of these truths. I pray that you would help us individually to discern if there's something in our in our lives that needs to be changed or if there's some way that we need to be challenged in order to be more like you, to be more useful to you, God. I pray that today as we humble ourselves before the authority of your word that we would um, once again appreciate and worship Jesus as our Savior, as God, as the one who is supreme with all authority. Father, we recognize that it is a privilege this morning to be able to um, understand and know, even even getting a a glimpse of the authority that Jesus possesses through um, the inspiration of your spirit to use Mark to pen these words. 
God, we are, uh, we are blessed. I pray that today you would help us as we, uh, as we study your word. I pray that you would help us to stay focused. I pray that you would help us to be attentive to what you would want us to learn. And I pray that you would help me as I speak. Help me to say what you would want me to say. Help me not to say anything that would distract from the truth of this passage. God, I pray that, that the result of our study this morning would be worship as we acknowledge your worthiness through the way that we handle this text, through the way that it is, um, it is taught. God, I pray that you would be worshiped. I pray that you would help me to communicate clearly, and I pray that you would help me not to, uh, um, not to say anything foolish. I pray that uh, you would lead us as we we humble ourselves before you. Thank you so much again for this text. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Desperation will either leave people with nothing or it will drive them to the proper solution. You see that over and over again. As people find themselves in a desperate state, they make quick decisions and they find themselves in a bad spot or they find themselves finding the solution. There's, a, there's kind of those two options. And um, what we recognize is that we are all ultimately in a desperate state. Even though many people don't realize it or act on it, we're all in a desperate state. Um, and there's, you know, I, I think of the, there's some serious and big issues that people struggle with, but one of the funny issues that uh, I was able to witness recently was when Titus found himself in a desperate state after he put a, a warhead in his mouth <laughs> and the sour punched him in the face. <laughs> he was desperate to get that candy out of his mouth as quick as possible, trying to find the solution. And... Uh, that desperation, uh, maybe you're familiar with it. The, the, the ups and downs of life, we tend to um, end up in those situations from time to time where we, we come to acknowledge that we, we can't do anything. We're, we're, um, we're not powerful enough to do anything about whatever the situation is, and we, we have to wrestle with that desperation and what we do with that desperation. Many of you are, are familiar with that, and this morning you can relate to the desperation of these two individuals, the desperation of Jairus, whose daughter is about to die, and this desperation of this woman who has had this uh, blood problem for 12 years. The desperation is intense, and so both of them are breaking through these different cultural barriers, these different um, religious barriers to get to Jesus. And the first thing that you see this morning is that Jesus is accessible. As both of these individuals come to him, they're able to get to him. Even when people are crowding around Jesus, Jesus is accessible. The, it says the crowds, they, they welcomed him, they gathered around him. Remember what has just happened? He's been on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and he has cast out the unclean spirits out of, uh, out of this man, right? And now they've all hopped back in the boat, and they come back to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and there's the crowd waiting for him again. And so they're, they're pressing in all around him. Um, it says a large crowd in verse 21, a large crowd gathered around him. And so he stayed by the seashore. And as he's there, this, this crowd comes around him. And, and then um, Jairus was able to get to him. You see that not only is Jesus concerned about these, these large groups of people, but he's also concerned for people individually. This is a theme in Jesus' ministry. He, he makes himself available. People come to him for various reasons, and some come to him to use him. Some come to him to be entertained by him. Some come seeking some um, help physically. Some seeking a political revolution. And some because they desire to know who he is. They want to know the truth. So Jesus makes himself available to the people, and I, I think... Um, one of the things that, that stands out right away in understanding the ministry that Jesus, um, Jesus had was that he was, he was always available for people. 
to remind, be a reminder for us that we ought not uh, fill up our life with so much that we're never available when someone needs help. We're here for those people that are around us, and that's the way that Jesus operated, and in, in such a way that even when Jairus is in need of help, there's this little story that happens, even as he's on his way to help Jairus' daughter, there's this story that happens with this woman who has this blood condition. So secondly, this morning, we see that Jairus was desperate. He was a, a ruler in the synagogue. This man would have been a leader, respected, honored, who is mature, devout, knowledgeable. It was his responsibility to care for the public services, right, that would take place um, in the synagogue. He would oversee the teachers and those who were to read the scriptures. They handled the religious aspects of life. They were connected with the religious establishment, with the scribes and the Pharisees. They were usually really closely connected together. This was a big deal of what is happening as Jairus comes to Jesus. A notable interaction because of the man's position within this religious system. And he is in this religious system recognizing that Jesus is someone who is, number one, to be worshipped, and number two, who has the power and the authority to help him in his desperate state with his daughter. This man had it all. He was a leader. He was respected. I could read through the list again, right? He's got it all. He's, he's attained this level of maturity and position and status, and he has it all, and yet he doesn't. His daughter is dying. So what does he do? He wants to get to Jesus. And then he wants to get Jesus to his daughter. I believe as fast as possible. And so he falls at Jesus' feet. He, he comes before Jesus humbly. And he begins to beg him or implore him. He knew that Jesus could make her well. We don't know all the details, but it would have been um, it would have been an interesting thing had this man in some setting previously had the opportunity to hear Jesus in a synagogue. What we do see is that he has faith that Jesus could heal his daughter, and so he shows up asking Jesus, imploring Jesus, begging Jesus to save his daughter, who's twelve years old. And so what we see in this text is this, this desperation, and this desperation gets layered with another desperate person. It also gets layered with this reminder that interactions with Jesus, they ultimately, they, they demand a response. So Jairus is desperate, and then as, as he is desperate to get Jesus to his daughter, there's this woman who is also desperate. And in this woman's desperation, she grabs onto Jesus' garment. This, we're told in the text, uh, verse 25, she had a, a hemorrhage. And she, she had this hemorrhage for 12 years. She was uncomfortable. Probably left her very weak. She has this blood condition. And really, this has become her identity. There's no, there's no name given about who she is. She is forever known as the woman who has this blood condition, the blood issue, right? If you look in your Bible, there's probably a little title there, a woman with issue, right? There's, there's, that, that's who she is. That's become her identity. She is known by her problem. So she has this problem, and secondly, we see that she was an outcast. She was unclean. According to Leviticus 15, she was ceremoni ceremonially unclean. Whatever she sits on, whatever she lies on, becomes unclean. No one could touch her or the things that she had touched, or they would be unclean. If she had a husband and they spent any time together, he would be unclean. This woman was not able to go into the synagogue. She wasn't allowed to hear the reading of Scripture. She was separated from the rest of the world, and she has gotten to this point of desperation. For 12 years, she's been trying to figure out a solution to this. She spends all the money that she has, and so now she has no resources. She spent all the money trying to find answers. 
And it says that instead of them, the physicians helping her, it says in verse 26, and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. Nothing was helping this woman. She has nowhere else to turn. She wasn't able to be healed by anyone. And Mark tells us that she endured much at the hands of many physicians. She endured much. This gives you a picture of her desperation. She was unclean. She wanted to find help. So bad that she spent all her money trying to find a cure. And after hearing about Jesus, notice it it began with hearing. And that led to her acting in faith. After hearing about Jesus, she comes up with with this plan. Verse 27 says, after hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak, for she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. If I only touch his garments. This woman, she could have, you know, there's a number of thoughts that could have gone through her mind, and she she could have given up, right? After 12 years trying to find a cure, she could have just said, well, I, it's, I've gone to see, I've seen all these doctors. I spent all this money. It, this is just, she could have accepted that that's who she was, a forever outcast. She could have said, I'm not fit for public. I, 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 can't, I, I can't be there. I mean, she could have even doubted, right? I don't think Jesus is all that people make him out to be. That could have been a thought. But she doesn't say that. What does she say? Well, she puts her faith in him, saying, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. If I just touch his garments, I'll get well. The woman was unclean because of her condition, and the only thing that could make things right was Jesus. Man, there's so many parallels here that, that we can relate with, right? Just like us, we often look for answers in wrong places. People spend all that they have looking for answers, right? Right? put money in this spot. This is going to make me happy. This is the next best thing. This is where I need to um, put my resources, time, energy, effort, etc. This woman, she finds what she's looking for in Jesus. The only one who can deal with us and our sin is the one can, who can heal us. It's Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is the beauty of the gospel, and this is what Jesus is able to offer. And so the woman, she forsakes all boundaries, and she came up behind Christ, and she, she touched the fringe of his cloak. That word touched it. It could mean to, to hang on to or to clutch it, to grab it. It's more intense than just this little brushing. But she, she's putting her faith in, in knowing what God can do and grabbing on to that, that cloak. This is her last and only hope. Her faith in Jesus has brought her to this point. And so she comes up behind him, hoping to remain invisible, Right? possibly fearful of public shame and realizing like there's this crowd that's around Jesus. And so as she touches Jesus, anybody else that she bumps into is becoming unclean, right? Because she herself is unclean. And that's the, that's the way that they viewed this, okay? And so ceremonially unclean, unfit. And, and so she's, she's taking a risk here. And Jesus displays in this moment his his flexibility, his love. He adjusts to the situation that just presented itself. And Jairus is in a hurry, right? He takes, you know, he take, he wants to get Jairus to his daughter. His daughter is dying. We Jesus, we gotta go. And Jesus stops in the middle of all of this crowd and realizes that this woman has grabbed onto his garment.
Jesus takes a moment to address this woman. Jesus, in his ministry, he is interrupted regularly. And regularly, you see him interacting with individuals. Helping other people is great. We just have to remember not to get so tunnel vision that we miss opportunities along the way. Here, this opportunity presents itself. Jesus steps in and he says, hang on a minute, we need to we need to deal with this. He could have just kept on going, right? This lady reaches out and grabs him. She's healed, perfect, great. Jesus keeps on going, no time's lost, moving his way on to Jairus' daughter. But that's not what he does. He stops for a minute. And as this woman grabs on to Jesus, it says immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Immediately, and gives us the implication that this was uh, Jesus' power. We know that this is what he does. This is the way that he heals. And Jesus asks, who is the one who touched me? The disciples, they give that um, kind of a, a little bit of a sarcastic uh, tone, maybe. Uh, you, Jesus, you see the crowd, right? Like, they're pressing in on you, and you say, who touched me? How did Jesus then know someone touched him? This is interesting. He knew that someone touched him because he perceived in himself that power, the power had proceeded from him and had gone forth. Perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth. This is an interesting thing to think about. That Jesus knows when power is transferred from him to this woman. He perceives it. He, he knows when this happens. And so Jesus then makes this a, a public deal. He calls the woman out. Jesus making it a public deal. I think he makes it a public deal for a number of reasons, but one of which is for her sake. It would publicly identify her as being healed. It was also a way of him dealing with her personally, dealing with her clearly. She was unable to slip away, but Jesus was able to connect with her. And I think what, what you might see in this text is also Jesus dealing with Jairus in some sense. Remember, I, I mentioned there's these two daughters, and the way that Jesus refers to this woman, he, he gives her, um, he calls her daughter in verse 34. And it may be that Jairus, is, as he's watching all of this, there's something that is happening in his heart in terms of the faith that he has directed at Jesus. We don't know all about that, but it seems that there is something that is happening here in the background. So she's unable to slip away, and everything changes at that moment. Usually her touch would defile a man, but Jesus' holiness is greater than her ability to defile someone. Greater than our sin, greater than our own defilement is Jesus. Can I, can I just give you a thought, like a little applicational thought, something interesting to think about? This is something interesting to think about, okay? So Jesus is aware when the power proceeds from him. I, I think he is aware every time the power proceeds from him. And when the work of sanctification takes place, every time you are empowered by him to walk in holiness, I believe that he is aware of it. Every time that you submit to his direction and by his power you overcome temptation or by his power you crucify the flesh, I, I don't think that Jesus is unaware. I think he is very much aware because of the the personal interaction that you see even taking place with this woman, is, uh, it reminds us of the personal interaction that he has had with us. Jesus is not absent. He is active, and he is actively with us as we are able to operate in his strength, in his power, overcoming weakness, overcoming temptation. Jesus is aware of it. Because it's by his power that we're able to overcome those things, right? I think that's, uh, 
think Jesus is so much aware that we are we are more intimately connected to him on a personal level than even we understand. That is the intimacy and in the relationship that we share with Jesus. And so this woman, she realizes she has not escaped unnoticed. Her response then was to worship him. She's afraid. She's trembling. She's aware of what had happened to her. It says in verse 33, and she came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. This is shaking, right? You see this woman, aware of what had happened to her. She comes and she falls down before him. Luke says, and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. She becomes a testimony of the power of God. And people recognize this. They see this. She makes this declaration. And what does Jesus do? He says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Jesus uses this term, daughter. He was compassionate with her. He was tender, gentle with her. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. And in calling her daughter, I think that he is referencing her as his child. It says, To those who believe, John, John 1.12 continues, To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. These are the ones who are children of God. She tells, he tells her that your faith has made you well. This is so interesting because people, you know, they look at this and they say, okay, what's, what's going on here? Is it just that there was some physical healing that was taking place? Or is there something deeper that is happening here? And I think what you see when you look into the, the Greek language is that there is something deeper that is happening here than just her physical uh, being made well. Whenever he says your faith has made you well, he says your faith has made you sozo. That is the Greek word used to describe being saved from sin. Now previously in verse 29, she, she felt that she was healed and there's, a, there's a, a definite word that is used there to describe her physical healing. Luke also uses a similar word that we get the word therapeutic from and has a similar meaning of being physically healed. But something different is used here by Jesus. The word here carries this meaning of being made well or being made whole or delivered or saved. What I think is that in this moment, this this woman's faith is recognized and not just a faith uh, that Jesus can heal her, but it is a faith in who Jesus is because she has heard about Jesus. This is why she responds the way that she responds. There is something deeper going on here than just this physical relief. something so deep that Jesus can tell her to go in peace. Go in peace. Now, this is a woman who has never experienced the peace that Jesus offers, but physically she has not experienced peace in this uh, being an outcast. And when he says go in peace, it may be, maybe even better translated is that it is to go into peace. It's like as she is Moving forward, she is more and more walking into the peace of God. That word peace, the Greek word there, it, it means to bring together, to join together that which has been separated. That everything is as it should be. There is this proper balance. And I think ultimately the only way that we're able to experience peace is knowing Jesus, is putting our faith 
in him. We have been separated from God by our sin. And so what we see in this woman, I think, is a picture of what Jesus has done for us. Our sin has separated us from God, but he has given us peace through the forgiveness that he offers. Isaiah 64, verse 6 says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean. This woman, her problem is that she's unclean. Isaiah says, actually, everybody is unclean. That's the problem. And he says, all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. All of us wither like a leaf, and in our iniquities, like the wind, it takes us away. So this unclean woman becomes a picture to us of God's ability to cleanse us of our sin. So he has established himself as a son of God through calming the wind and the waves. He has control over creation. And then he has this authority to cast out these unclean spirits and many unclean spirits, right? The, the demonic spirits. He casts them out. He has, he has that authority to be able to do that. And then in this case, you see him operating with this, with this woman on such a level just to point out his ability to save her. He has the ability to forgive sin. Over and over again, as the Son of God, recognized as God, he has this authority. And so this unclean woman becomes a picture to us of God's ability to cleanse us from our sin. Titus 3.5 says, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Those who are unclean, they could be made clean. Ceremonial washing, etc. This woman, she was unclean because of this blood condition and it wouldn't go away. Consistently unclean. God makes a way for us to be made clean. In 1 Corinthians 6, 11, it says, such were some of you. There's a long list of of sins and, and grievous deeds. And so he says, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So this woman becomes a picture of what God has done for us. Her desperation, we can identify with. We can recognize that we have the same kind of desperation because there is nothing in and of ourselves that we can do to make uh, to, to, to create a solution for our sin problem. We're in a desperate state. There's nothing this woman can do to fix her blood problem. She tries everything. She spends all her money trying to fix it. She's still an outcast. She's still unclean. Jesus is the only solution. He's the only solution for her physically. He's the only solution for her spiritually. We recognize that Jesus cleanses us and he allows us to enjoy this relationship with him. And so Jesus then, he makes it clear it was her faith that made, made her well. Her, her faith is active. It, it provokes this, um, this motion and nothing could turn her away. She grabs out onto that garment. The object of her faith is Jesus. This was the only one who could help her. We see here faith in the perfect tense, meaning it was a permanent healing. So faith is a uh, simple remedy with these profound implications. No more is she afflicted by her sin problem. No longer is she afflicted by the uncleanness of her, bro of her blood problem, but she is healed of her affliction. Man, what do you think her, uh, her attitude was like on that day? The joy, the peace, the excitement, being able to be a part of society again, being able to be a part of um, worship again, being able to be around her, her family, old friends, etc., right? 
everything that was messed up in your life is now put back into order. And bigger than that is that she had this sin problem, and Jesus has dealt with it. And so she becomes this picture of what Jesus can do in our affliction. And um, man, how, how, a, how appreciative she must have been to have the power of God impact her life in such a way. And, and here we are, right? And we say, okay, so what do we do with this? This is an incredible story. This woman's life was transformed. Well, number one is that you, you have the opportunity to allow God to transform your life through Jesus. But number two is in understanding the transformation power of God, the way that he makes us a new creature through the faith that we express in Jesus, the, that should change us, right? It, it should, um, it impacts our purpose. It gives us a, a, a new reason for being. It gives us peace. We no longer have to worry about this affliction of our sin. Such a beautiful picture of what God has done for us. I hope it puts you in a position of thankfulness and gratitude and worship because that's exactly where this woman was and that is exactly where we ought to be if you have experienced what God offers in, sal in salvation. How he has offered Jesus to die on a cross for your sins so that you can have and enjoy this relationship with him, making the things that were separated put back together. Everything is as it ought to be, reconciled. And so the, the story continues, but this morning we focus on the woman with this blood issue. And as the story continues, you, you see the way that Jesus deals with Jairus' daughter, but in the middle of all of this, you see Jesus pause and deal with this woman personally. He makes himself available, just as he makes himself available today as the solution to our sin problem. We can rejoice in that, can't we? Yeah. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful for this, um, this picture that is on display for us of what you have, what you have done in rescuing us and, and saving us and redeeming us. Father, I thank you that you have made a way for us to be seen as, as righteous, not, not because we have anything righteous in and of ourselves, but because you make us righteous. through the blood that was spilt on the cross on our behalf. God, we thank you for that, that sacrifice. We, we recognize that we are, um, we're all sinners, and apart from you, we have no hope. Thank you for giving us hope. Thank you for giving us peace. Thank you for making things right, and thank you that we're able to see this personal interaction and understand that you are a personal God, that you deal with us. And we, we recognize as a personal God, we each personally have, um, we're each personally confronted with this, um, this moment in which we have to examine whether or not we have put our faith in you. We recognize that uh, we we can't be saved because of anything that someone else does apart from what Jesus has done. So this morning, if there is someone who is trying to figure things out, if there's someone who is um, wading through the, the consequences of their sins and trying to determine their, their place before you, God, I pray that they would, they would see their their own sinfulness, but also see the, the blessing of forgiveness that you offer. As we 
through faith in Jesus. We appreciate and enjoy this relationship. A relationship that sin broke. You were more powerful to be able to make us alive again. Father, it is a blessing to be able to enjoy this relationship with you. And help us this week as we enjoy this relationship. Help us to enjoy you, worship you in such a way that the people around us want to know what's going on. I'm sure that as this woman stood up, there was a lot of people that were asking the question of what's going on. God, help us to be a testimony for you this week. We love you and we thank you for the grace that you've shown to us this morning in letting us study this text and be reminded of the glories of the gospel and the greatness of the salvation that you have given to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.